All right, so let's get started. Um, Dr. Andrew Wilson, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank Pleasure, you, Rich. Pleasure, well, please, uh, for being online. Um, I'll just give uh, Andrew a very brief introduction. So, um, Dr. Andrew Wilson is the Chief Economist of My Housing Market, and he's been a leading economist for a number of uh, prestigious groups, including Domain, Australian Property Monitors, and, uh, and has a, more letters after his name than the, uh, the alphabet. Um, so uh, it's great to have you on board, Andrew. And uh, really, Pleasure, Rich. Yeah, good on you, mate. You're sharing your advice with us today. Uh, for myself, I'm the CEO of propertybuyer.com.au. Um, I manage a team of expert buyers agents uh, around the country. We buy homes, investment properties, commercial properties and sites, and we've been awarded as Australia's most awarded buyers agents. So today we're talking about a very interesting topic, and um, we're going to be talking about the Australian housing market and particularly the impact of COVID-19 on the property market, Andrew. And we're really seeing at the moment pretty much a lot of people sitting on their hands in pause mode. But I want to talk with you today a lot about some of the underlying drivers and yep. see, has it, is there going to be some significant changes? Are the fears, uh, you know, obviously we've got some pretty big economic impacts happening. Unemployment is definitely taking a big spike. IMF came out today uh, with their latest reports on the economy. So let's kick off, Andrew, just, um, whoops, gone too fast. Um, just on where we're at with the COVID virus. And so what I've just done is put up the most recent number of cases and deaths and people who recovered from COVID uh, on the screen there. We can see that Australia's been pretty fortunate in, in sort of containing um, the widespread number of deaths. Obviously, it's tragic for all of those who've been involved and our hearts go out to them. But um, obviously, the government has, has locked down pretty quickly. So we're seeing a... Um, obviously a spike there in the number of cases and you can see it's they're petering off quite rapidly. So it's great to see everyone doing the right thing. Um, but Andrew, let's move, I guess, straight away to the impact on the property market. And the question is, first up, where are we up to in the housing market right now? And are we going to see a crash or will prices hold up? What's your view of where we're at? Well, it's certainly early days, Rich. There's no doubt about that. Um, this has been, I guess, a, a month when we've um, really been I guess, impacted to now almost a full lockdown. But I think it's interesting that um, despite in, in early days, it's always the fear factor. I think that uh, even your comment on a crash is reflects that, that we're in uncharted waters at the moment. We don't know where we're going. We don't have a lot of data to support us. Um, usually we have those weekend to weekend auction clearance rates give us a good feel for how our housing markets are tracking. and. Uh, of course, with the auction markets now um, having been virtually cancelled, as we know them, because outdoor auctions are banned, we don't have those um, weekend to weekend clearance rates and volumes to be able to understand how our markets are going. So we have to look at other mechanisms for, um, for activity. Now, I run a, I've introduced a new measure, which is a newly listed property index which tells us how many, on a day-to-day -day basis, how many newly listed properties are coming into the market uh, nationally. Um, now, uh, as I said, the latest data, or the latest data which I tracked to yesterday, shows a steep decline over the past week. Now, that shouldn't be surprising because it's Easter, and we always see this time of the year a, a, a lack of new listings coming through. But if we compare um, the same period to a year ago, uh, that is to the Tuesday following Easter last year, we can see that new listings, and this is newly listed properties, remember, are down by around 20%. Mm. So I guess that probably tells us intuitively, and we would expect that, that there are 20% fewer new listings that have come into the market over the past week mm. compared to the same period a year ago. Now, there's still some cyclical factors. Last year was a quieter period at this time of the year, starting to build up a little bit for new listings. But I think that tells us that it's not, at this point anyway, a crash in the number of people who are prepared to put their houses on the market. That's interesting, Andrew. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's good to hear 20% fewer, Rich, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's have a look briefly at um, the core logic numbers uh, just recently for the last quarter. Uh, this is from January to the end of March, and we can see that um, in Sydney had a 3.9% rise and in March, a 1.1% rise. Melbourne, 0.4% rise in March and a 2.9% rise in the quarter. So this, these figures don't show the dramatic impact no. of COVID-19 yet, but it's, it's sort of an interesting benchmark point, Andrew, to, to the point that this is what happened before we went into yes. the COVID lockdown. 
Yeah, that's right, Rich. And these numbers are still quite strong. I mean, the monthly numbers tend to be volatile. Mm -hmm. It's probably better to look at the quarterly numbers, but um, certainly those numbers are, are still quite strong. Perhaps they are lower than the December quarter data. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we would expect that uh, some early, I guess, signs of the impact of uh, coronavirus. But uh, nonetheless, those numbers for particularly Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane are still quite strong. And if we, we took that on an annualised basis, um, we're looking at, you know, 12%, 16% uh, rise in prices on an annual basis mm. um, for Melbourne and Sydney. And of course, that's a very strong result. And there's yeah. no doubt that markets started the year off just as strong as they finished the year last year. So I guess in that sense, there's no doubt that our markets generally, particularly the big three, as I could perhaps call them, Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, were in fine shape uh, until the coronavirus issue uh, yeah. hit. And of course, the question is what impact that will have. Um, and, and I think that slide you showed gives us some confidence that perhaps this shutdown will uh, finish sooner rather than later. Of course, we are all hopeful of that uh, because the sooner it does finish, the more we can get about to resolving what will be significant uh, economic issues. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that will work its way back into a, a fundamentally more stable housing market. That's right. So let's have a look, Andrew, just as again, we're talking about uh, movements in, in prices uh, yep. over the, the last 12 months and five years. Again, from CoreLogic, we can see that the Sydney market actually uh, rose 23% over the past five years, 31% for Melbourne over the past five years, and Brisbane 10%. Um, so interesting to see, as you say, rather than look at a monthly number, which is more volatile, yep. to look at, at property figures over a longer period of time is really important. And I know we'll come to some more data, particularly from the slides you provided later in our yep. presentation today. But I'll just also briefly go, Andrew, to weekly asking prices. And yep. we can see here that uh, SQM track uh, weekly asking prices and obviously have been trending up following actual median house price movements. But obviously, um, we're going to have a look in a little more detail what's happening here in prices right now in the April market. And we'll just go now to our auction clearance rates. And I think this is a leading indicator where we're seeing, um, you know, particularly some of them falling off a bit of a cliff. But as you say, we've had Easter, we've had a lot of people withdraw their properties um, from market. So it's, it's, um, it's a natural reaction. What would you say about where auctions are at for both Sydney and Melbourne at the moment, Andrew? Well, those, that table shows it's nothing really rich because the way auction clearance rates are measured is that withdrawals are counted as a non-sale. Mm. So uh, it, it basically means the same as if a property was passed in. Mm. Um, and what we did see in the two weeks before Easter, when the restrictions on auction selling were introduced, was a, a remarkable number of properties withdrawn from auction. Now, the two weeks before Easter, uh, would have been uh, in Sydney, one, well, it would have been a record weekend, the weekend before Easter for auction activity, uh, nearly 1,300 auctions scheduled, which would have been an all-time record. And Melbourne also had very strong numbers. Now, what we did was have a high proportion of those withdrawn because of the banning of outdoor auctions and, of course, uh, you know, issues to do with confidence. Now, that meant that clearance rates, you know, plunged because it was counted. Hundreds and hundreds of auctions that were withdrawn were actually counted as a non-sale. So it really wasn't telling us it was not not a sale, it was telling us that they were withdrawn because they couldn't be auctioned yeah. in the traditional manner. So that really did tell us you know, nothing. And this is the point that we won't have that auction data coming forward as a weekend to weekend snapshot of the market in the future uh, because we have this ban on, 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 on auctions. But interestingly enough, Rich, as you would know, is we're actually seeing a lot of agents moving into online auctions now. Mm. So that might not be as, uh, as a significant impediment to our week, in, week, in, uh, week to week uh, snapshot of the market. But certainly the last two weekends, the clearance rates there uh, really told us, told us nothing because of those remarkable numbers of withdrawn properties That's right. uh, counting as, as past ends. But look, it, it will be interesting to see how those online auctions are reported. There's actually uh, more than 3,000 are scheduled now over the next few weekends in mm. Australia, online auctions. Yeah. Now, whether these are online auctions or you know, private treaties or expressions of interest by another name, we'll see. This is a fluid environment and agents are adapting to the new circumstances. Mm. Um, 
But uh, again, this, this, this is showing us nothing in terms of the last couple of weekends auction clearance rates. It actually reveals the flaws in the methodology of anything. Yeah, that's true. Well, it'll be interesting to see and uh, I guess watch this space. So um, if we look at, as you said, the, the total numbers of yeah, we, yeah. Year withdrawn uh, right across the market. So yeah. it's, it shows so many that as you're yeah. just pointing out, there's the huge numbers withdrawn, 1142, uh, 1577 in, uh, in Brisbane. So you, you make that point very clearly. We just uh, you know, can't put all our faith in auction clearance rates. And if I just mention, Rich, if we, yeah. if we looked at that slide previously, yeah. if we take the withdrawals out and just discount them, and yeah. just look at the number of sold versus the number of, of passed in, yeah. you can see the clearance rate at the far right-hand corner is a lot different. Absolutely. It, you know, and, that's, and that really tells the story because they were the number of properties sold versus the numbers of the properties passed in. Yeah. And it shows you that by counting withdrawals as being a non-sale really is, is a, a flaw in the methodology. Yeah. And I think it's something that's got to be addressed because when we look at just sold versus not sold, um, we get a totally different result. Absolutely, no, very good point. And um, Andrew, in your opening comments, you did talk about yes. um, the volume yep. of listings dropping off yep. quite significantly. So just briefly explain what's been happening here the last uh, couple of weeks and, and the volume of listings. Well, that's what I explained before, Rich, as I explained, this is a, a, an index that measures newly listed homes. So this is in the total number of listings. This is newly listed homes taken each day for the previous week. So each day you measure the number of newly listed homes uh, for the past week, and then you do the same for the next day for the, that previous week. And I created an index based at 100 on the 1st of March. So that gives us a starting point prior to the coronavirus issue. So at that starting point of 100, we can see that uh, newly listed properties increased by uh, 7% to their peak there on the 6th of March. But since then, we've seen a, a gradual decline in newly listed properties. Now, obviously, the last week, we've seen a sharp decline, but that is the Easter effect pr pr primarily. And we do see a drop off in newly listed properties over the Easter week. And this, is, this data is up until Monday. Mm -hmm. And if we compare that, however, to Easter last year, we can see that uh, with a similar drop off, um, we, can use, we can take out that Easter seasonal effect um, but the data to yesterday shows that we've had a 20% decline in the number of newly listed properties over the week ending uh, the Tuesday after Easter mm. compared to the same week last year. So that's not too bad, really. 20% yeah. um, decline in, the, I guess, the real peak of the fear factor for our housing markets uh, um, on that newly listed basis. And this tells us, Rich, what sellers are thinking at the moment in terms mm. of the market. So we still have quite reasonable numbers of new properties coming into the marketplace, despite that lack of confidence. So we can be, you know, at this point of time anyway, uh, reasonably, I, I guess, um, positive about the prospects of the, the market, but we would need to see how this evolves over the next few weeks. So watch out for, the, for this index going forward okay. as it tracks newly listed properties. It sounds good, all right. So Andrew, um, it's great to look at the current snapshot. So let's look at now this, this question about the macroeconomic forces that are these key drivers of the housing market. And um, I, I love your formula here, people plus houses plus economy. So let's unpack each of those, uh, those things and talk about migration. Let's talk about current dwelling approvals and where interest rates are going. And uh, this is not economics 101. This is real life economics that affects everyone's bottom line and everyone's roof over their head. So let's, um, let's get into this and maybe kick it off, Andrew, with just a quick discussion on, on interest rates and, and give us your, your thoughts on where interest rates are and where we're going. Well, look, the, the, slide, the previous slide basically says, Rich, there are three key factors in determining house prices. And the first is new demand, and that really essentially is migration. Uh, and then there's new supply, which is new building to match that new demand. And the glue that holds it all together are, are interest rates, and that reflects the economy. Yeah. So we can look at those key factors on individual market uh, on individual markets, and they give us an idea of not just why markets are where they are, but where markets are likely to go. But the glue that holds it all together, Rich, are clearly interest rates, and we can see, you know, over the journey uh, since the last, um, uh, I guess, over the last fifteen years, the the uh, the the track, the path of interest rates has certainly been that typical roller coaster ride um, that. Uh, 
has uh, you know, created the peaks and troughs, not only of interest rates and mortgage rates, but also of, um, of house prices. Mm. Higher interest rates mean lower house prices, lower house prices, uh, lower interest rates mean uh, higher house prices. And we've seen that um, really track its way up until uh, really current uh, market environment because we had three uh, interest rate cuts last year, of course, second half of last year. Uh, and that um, we had one, we've had rate cuts earlier this year. And that's helped to generate higher house prices because it makes housing more affordable. You pay less uh, in terms of uh, increases your capacity to purchase a property because you can pay more with a given income because your interest rate repayment is lower because your interest rate is lower. Um, so the interesting thing we have now, Rich, is that that trend will finish because we are now at the point of interest rates being at or basically at zero for the foreseeable future. And the foreseeable future really is we're not talking months here, we are talking years. And if we take out that energy force of interest rates from our housing markets, it means that we don't, we're not a hostage to rises and falls in interest rates because they're not going to occur. Mm. Not certainly in a cycle as we've seen in previous business cycles. So a question that immediately jumps to my mind as perhaps a home buyer or investor, Andrew, is, well, if interest rates are gonna be low for a long time, how yep. do I get capital growth? Well, we've had capital growth before, Rich, but it's been in the context of that roller coaster. Mm. So we've had periods of very strong growth and then we've had periods of declining growth. So it's about where we sort of end up on average over time through that wave roller coaster effect. Mm. Now, I don't think, well, we're not going to have that same sort of roller coaster effect going forward on house prices because we don't have that same roller coaster uh, uh, impact from interest rates. Mm. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, prices growth will be uh, a lot more steady and stable through, um, through the cycles because the cycles will be a lot flatter. So I believe the longer term growth potential for, um, for uh, house prices is around about 5% per annum. Mm -hmm. And that reflects what is income growth because if we don't have interest rates increasing to give us that capacity to pay more for a property or interest rates falling to pay more for a property, then we're really only a hostel. We can only really have higher incomes allowing us to pay more for a property. Yeah. Um, and income growth, I think, will be around about 2 to 3% going forward. Yeah. If we add local factors and uh, inflation to that, we then get around about 5%, I think, as a maximum outcome for capital growth yeah. um, uh, for a general for capital city markets. And I think if you think about that, Rich, again, with low interest rates and low incomes growth, it's actually quite a heady uh, result given what other asset classes are returning at the moment. That's right. And that's the whole point. As interest rates have fallen, yeah. so has the energy of uh, incomes and the energy of inflation and returns on investment have fallen likewise because they both reflect the same thing. Yeah. So if we have zero-ish interest rates, it means we're going to have inflation at around uh, you know, those sort of benign effects and also benign levels and also incomes growth as well. So it means that, yes, we will get 5%-ish uh, growth in, uh, in capital growth in, in housing, I believe, but it'll be a more consistent result uh, going forward, and it'll certainly be a better result uh, in a relative sense than other asset classes. Rich, you only have to look at bank uh, deposit rates at the moment uh, to sort of understand that. Even yields on property is That's significantly right. higher than exactly. the less than 1% you get for a term deposit for $10,000 or more uh, over a year. Uh, yeah, at, you in a term deposit to go backwards, you know. I think the and other thing still have, and you still have, oh. you're Sorry, Rich, you still have those tax advantages as well, you know, yes. as a deposit. Sorry about that. Yeah. I think the other thing when we're talking about interest, pro, pro, um, interest rates and house price growth, it also comes back to, you talk about local factors, and for me yes. as a... As, yep. a, as a property advisor, it's really important that people make wise decisions on where they invest in property and, and what types of properties, because the location is paramount. So investing in areas or buying in areas that has a, a higher per capita income, uh, where people have the ability to do uh, you know, more prestigious houses or, or, or this higher income growth has a greater propensity then to potentially see uh, higher capital growth. So looking at those, those local factors is, is very important. It's not saying that you only invest in prestige areas, absolutely not, but you've got to look at um, a whole range of local factors that are going to determine 
house price growth. Um, Andrew, we might just move on to the next one here. Oh, you have talked about... This well, we spoke about that, and that's, that shows us the, um, uh, yeah. the track of interest rates, that roller coaster ride, mm-hmm. and it shows the relationship between prices and interest rates uh, through mm-hmm. that particular journey. You can see higher interest rates, which we had during that mining boom. Nine and a half percent. Uh, and seven, eight. We had higher rates to try to take the heat out of the economy. Mm. Mortgage rates up to nearly 10%. Of course, the GFC came along. We cut rates then. Mortgage rates fell to stimulate the economy. House prices increased. Mm. Mining boom two. Interest rates up again to, mm. because we had higher inflation. Reserve Bank pushed up rates. Mm. Um, we saw uh, house prices falling. But of course, we've seen interest rates fall consistently since the second mining boom ended, mm. um, except for those... Um, uh, those movements that were uh, conducted by APRA, you can see that in uh, uh, 2016, 15 and 2019, APRA actually uh, acted to increase interest rates, uh, which pushed prices down through that period. And in fact, the, uh, the impact of those interest rate increases as a consequence of APRA policy in 2019 was really the catalyst that pulled the market down uh, sharply at the end of 2018 and into 2019. And really it was confidence that was the key factor that drove prices down uh, uh, in uh, late 2018 and early 2019 um, because of the particularly negativity that we had in terms of commentary on the marketplace. I thought it was, I was going to say, Rich, on that slide you showed with the data that showed that Sydney and Melbourne house prices had increased by over 10% over the past year. If we hark back a year, there were predictions throughout the media that house prices uh, in Sydney and Melbourne particularly would fall by uh, some ridiculous predictions of up to 40% yeah. last year. Well, now, the reality be- was that house prices actually increased by nearly 15%. So yeah. most of those doomsayers, and there were certainly a lot of them in the market, got it completely wrong. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it, w- it was about fueling the clickbait that negative headlines about property made. Now you think about the buyer that entered into the market despite all those uh, negative headlines uh, in uh, early 2019 and purchased property then, they're now around 15% better off uh, with their property values as they stand. Now, of course, we're gonna have some consequences of from the coronavirus issues, but um, you know, having said that, uh, you know, we will again move into that recovery stage. So it is about exactly what you said, looking at those local factors now, and more particularly given that we have that the, 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 uh, the drive from interest rates, the influence from interest rates will not be as strong because interest rates are basically flat for the long term. Uh, so it will be more about local factors identifying where our buying opportunities are. And the very first slide we showed, it looks at factors, uh, general macro factors, such as the level of migration and uh, the level of home building that are important. Let's let's have a look. So just to summarise here, we're obviously we've said we're not going to see interest rates rise anytime soon. Um, Let's move on to, uh, you've mentioned wages as well. Uh, Any other key points you want to make about about wages? Well, look, this is the chart that just gives us the, the rationale between why interest rates fell. And the gold line there is uh, is the Reserve Bank's interest rate uh, settings up until uh, December last year. Of course, they were cut and cut and cut because the black line, which is incomes, uh, just didn't respond as it normally does to lower interest rates. Mm. I mean, the theory is like, you know, lower interest rates puts more money in your pocket, so you go out and spend, uh, which creates, you know, higher incomes because businesses become more profitable because they're producing more goods because you're spending more. Didn't happen. Incomes growth has remained flat. And of course, without incomes growth, we haven't got the inflation, we haven't got inflation as a result. Mm -hmm. So that lack of prosperity, which if we look at 2011, 12, which was the previous mining boom, we don't have that anymore, which is what we want because we want incomes to be well ahead of prices. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a profit. And that's why interest rates were kept falling because we didn't get the income result. Mm. And this has been a conundrum for policymakers right across uh, right across the board. Most advanced economies, although they've done okay with employment, haven't been able to get incomes rising. And that's why um, I'm not sure even the Reserve Bank policies in regard to quantitative easing, which is designed to get 
interest rates for credit cards and personal loans down, I don't think that's going to have much of an effect either because incomes growth is too low to take advantage of it. People right. just don't have the money to spend, Rich. Yeah, that's it. All right, well, we'll come to some of those policy settings later, but let's just talk very briefly, Andrew, just about what impact is going to happen from the COVID crisis on the economy. And obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about how deep and how long uh, we're going to have, and it looks very likely we're going to have a recession. Uh, the question is, you know, how much negative growth are we going to have and for how long? Will it be one quarter, two quarters, three quarters? Um, so take us through your perspective, Andrew, on what your view is on the likelihood of a recession and how deep it may be. Well, Rich, this is the GDP chart to our most recent data, and, and that's the December quarter. Um, GDP was quite low, and that's been a product essentially of low incomes, as we've discussed just previously. People aren't spending, consumption is low, that's kept our our GDP quite low. Um, again, this is something that's common to most similar advanced economies. Uh, we're going to get very close to zero over the March quarter. Um, obviously, the full impact of the coronavirus won't be felt until the June quarter. So uh, we're still a chance of being above water over the, um, over the June quarter, over the March quarter. Now, the June quarter, certainly uh, the likelihood is that we will move into negative growth, GDP. Um, and then, of course, the September quarter, hopefully, is our recovery position. Mm -hmm. now, you've got to understand that a lot of government spending is going to occur through mm -hmm. um, that period. And government spending is a positive in terms of GDP. So I wouldn't be as negative about the potential for a recession. I think that the June quarter um, is likely to be a negative period. Uh, I think the September quarter, again, is likely to be negative, but probably not as negative as, um, as is predicted. Yeah. Uh, and I think that given, and it's all about the, um, the revival policies uh, of the government and how our economy responds yeah. as to whether we uh, have another negative or we have a negative quarter That's in right. September. But I think the, the odds are certainly that yeah. the June and September quarters will be negative. That will bring us into a technical recession for the first time since 91, 92. But we've got to understand that this is something brought about by extraordinary circumstances and not a judgment on our economy per mm. se. Mm. Um, it's yeah. not which, which 90, 91, 92 was a judgment on our economy mm. because our economy overheated to the point where it had to be tapped out yes. and that resulted in a recession. This right. is nothing to do with that. Mm. Uh, and I do think that, and I just about the economy, Rich, that we should be quite positive about Australia's economic prospects because we are a very strong economy, essentially, with a small population, uh, and we're well positioned to recover, particularly compared to other economies. We still have a very strong export sector. I am quite confident the government will be able to maintain reasonable migration levels. They'll also be able to um, support our international student uh, export sector. Also, mm. tourism, I think that there can be work done on that. Uh, and I think that we will continue to get strong growth from our resource sectors, uh, particularly iron ore and coal, um, which we are still a very strong supplier of that to China. Uh, and I think that given those circumstances, we can be reasonably optimistic uh, of our position going forward to recover, mm. as I said, given our small population and very strong export sector. But a lot will... Um, be determined by, uh, you know, what the government does uh, in terms of its policy response. But we've got to understand the government is on a hiding to nothing here. They have to do what it takes mm. to get back uh, to a full economic recovery. Mm. Well, this is this is exactly your summary here. So it's as you say, it's hit us from left field. Um, the government was sort of trying to get the the, the surplus, the, sorry, the deficit, the government deficit, and uh, into a surplus, and uh, they're starting from a strong position. But obviously, it's feeling like there's no tomorrow. To, as you say, to do whatever it takes to get us through this uh, this uh, economic period. Um, let's move now to that second one. We've talked about interest rates uh, impact on the economy, but let's talk about people and particularly yep. migration. So, what what's your view on migration as a as a key kicker for the housing market, Andrew? Well, migra migration has certainly been a, 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 a has supported the difference between and as we spoke about local factors, strong growth, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, New South Wales and Victoria recorded record levels of migration 
uh, through 2014 to 2017. That was a key factor in pushing up house prices. Um, uh, conversely, we saw Perth and uh, Brisbane record negative uh, migration or certainly strongly reduced migration levels as a result of the end of the mining boom, the end of the fly in, fly outs. We can see that high migration there uh, translated itself not only into strong house price growth, but also uh, in Melbourne and Sydney, but also into strong jobs growth. And that is a key factor to, as I said before, to maintain our migration levels uh, at strong, uh, for strong results for migration levels to maintain economic growth that we've right. uh, well, we, we have a, on the We have a highly multicultural society, Andrew, don't yep. we? And we, yep. we welcome, uh, obviously, uh, with our borders, a uh, skilled migration program, because otherwise we're just going to go backward as an economy. So it's interesting to see the numbers there dropped off from, what, 240,000 out of 200,000. Uh, so, uh, but obviously we need to keep our, get our borders open as, as quickly as we can to... Uh, and I think we'll be a key destination, Rich, for those wanting to migrate into a perceived safe haven, into a perceived true. strong mm. economy. And I think that it will be even more favoured yes, by right. high level, high, yeah. high skilled, high quality migrants. That's right. Okay, um, Andrew, this is another big question for you. So has coronavirus fundamentally changed the property market? So is what's going on now going to mean our market is, is changed forever or not? What's your view on that? No, we've still got to live somewhere, Rich. Okay. That's not going to change at all. Um, Australians always have, and that makes us a, a real difference uh, in the sense of a lot of other similar mm. economies. We have a very strong aspiration for home ownership, very strong um, aspiration for uh, small scale home investment. We know that the road to wealth and prosperity and security and social acceptance is through home ownership. Um, that comes again from our multicultural background. A lot of our cultures understand the, uh, I guess the security of home ownership and investment, bricks and mortar, safest houses, all those types of sayings uh, reflect that fundamental connection we have with our housing market. So nothing will fundamentally change from that. Mm. Um, and of course, uh, I think some of the fundamentals that may change is the way we market property. Mm. And I'm, I'm not sure that that'll change. We've seen the end of auctions because of the sanctions on outdoor gatherings. Um, and now we're seeing this switch to online auctions, which has happened quicker than I thought. Mm. Um, and perhaps there's a few bugs to iron out with that. Well, but, I, think it'll just uh, yeah. I think there'll be a mix, Andrew, of online auctions once yep. the, the shutdown's over. I think we'll see more people participate online, but we'll, think yep. we'll go back to having people in that, in that atmosphere. But I guess one of the advantages just on that for, for buyers at the moment is auctions have lost their mojo. Um, yep. You know, you've got the auctioneer doing his song and dance in front of an iPhone, trying yep. to cajole everyone to get, make a bid. And so yeah. it's certainly, uh, it's not as a competitive environment as it used to be. It's a bit more, uh, a bit more distant. So it'd be interesting to see how that, that goes forward. Um, but I guess you've mentioned here, Andrew, that, that markets have, have regained confidence, but yes. the drivers are strong. Uh, yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, we had regained confidence. It was a confidence factor, the fear factor that pushed markets down in late 2018 and early 2019. Of course, the market bought into all the nonsense about 40% price falls and all the other ridiculous predictions. Well, that that's only if you watch 60-minute stories, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. Uh, I mean, good luck to the, the media. They obviously generated uh, lots of attention from that. And uh, those that made those predictions, I, you know, good luck to them in far, as far as their credibility and reputations are concerned. Mm. Well, that obviously is not a concern, but uh, mm. uh, there, it was, you know, a completely ridiculous predictions. But we're sort of used to that, Rich. Mm. We've seen those types of... Uh, you know, those types of events, the minute we've had a, 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 a cyclical easing of house price growth, uh, yeah. you know, they all come running from overseas, wherever, predicting doom and gloom and crashing for the housing market. And of course, I can all tell you, Andrew, just, just on that, I can tell you that when that 60 Minutes uh, story went to air in 2019, just before it happened, they rang me up to interview me and asked me some questions. And uh, I think obviously on the basis of my response that I wasn't a complete doomsayer, they declined then to put me on air. Um, but they decided to put those that have gave them the most dramatic uh, headlines and obviously took them out of context as well. And then they got their 40% reduction quote. So uh, I guess you just the message is just be very careful about what facts you listen to and what media uh, you get. You need to get a, a balanced perspective. And I think uh, obviously your commentary, Andrew, is always very, very highly sought after. So, um, yeah. Well, thanks, Rich. Yeah, look, at, and look I, I, don't, I don't blame the media. You can't blame the media mm. for... Uh, 
finding a headline that attracts people. It's up to people. And, and you know, misinformation mm. uh, is uh, the curse of the property market, Rich. We all know that. Mm. Um, mm. You know, but it's up to people to be more informed. Mm. And what happens is, is if you buy into misinformation, you miss out. And that's what I, my point before was that those that ignored the rubbish that was promoted uh, by those doomsayers mm. a year ago uh, and bought properties are now 15% better off because they took advantage of the fear uh, and the irrationality that people had uh, that bought into that misinformation that was clearly, you know, uh, ridiculous on any level, uh, which was proven in terms of it being a potential outcome. Mm. And as I said, we've just got to become more uh, circumspect about who we listen to and, and I guess, it, I mean, our markets have been, uh, you know, remarkably resilient and robust over a long period of time, Rich, and, and yet people still don't seem to believe it. But I do think that's all part of how connected we are to the housing market, how important it is to us mm. that, you know, we, we are very interested when there's any negative headline coming around. And that's, I guess, what can you say, you know? Well, but, I, guess, I guess also just to mention the fact, what are the numbers? You know, we've got six and a half trillion or almost $7 trillion tied up in the residential, in the property market in Australia, you know, and around one and a half trillion in the share market. So property is absolutely a fundamental uh, key driver or key factor for our whole economy. Um, absolutely. But um, I think one of the key points to Andrew, just going back to one of our original points at the beginning, we talked about just before COVID-19 crisis hit, what sort of shape was the property market in? And I can tell you from my experience is this, is that we, we started to see strong inquiry for our buyer's agent service, probably from about mid to late January, as it often does after the holiday season, people come back and go, yep, okay, ready to buy my next home or next investment property. We got lots of calls, we started out, and then rapidly, as we saw, the auction clearance rates were pretty strong right through yep. that February period, yep. even into early March. And we were expecting to see a really kind of, wow, that all those forecasts of 10 to 14% growth this year might actually come true. Yep. We weren't expecting it to sort of rebound so strongly. So what the figures are here that you've got is, is the March quarter price growth. So it's still pretty strong. Uh, I mean, you annualise 4%, what, you've got a 16% growth rate. Yep. So that's what we've come off the back of before we hit this crisis, Andrew. And I think um, just going forward, if you maybe take us through your... Wilson curve, which I love. So maybe just take us through you where you see each of the, the capital city markets at the moment. Well, obviously, this is where we were pre-coronavirus now. Um, and we look at those numbers, Rich, in terms of prices growth. Um, there was no surprise that Melbourne and Sydney were growing quite strongly through the latter half of last year and into this year. Mm. And those that were predicting that this wasn't going to continue, again, didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, and we get a lot of that in this business. But um, Melbourne and Sydney, although they were growing faster than any of the other capital city markets and at very strong rates historically over the quarter, were still below where they were in 2017. And this is the whole point, Rich, that prices were growing because it was catch-up energy. Of mm. course, buyers were buying, because why wouldn't you buy if you could buy a property that was still cheaper than mm. when it was sold, in, or, you know, mm. than its value was in 2017? Yeah. So it was just like a vacuum sucking up back to where those previous peak points were. And that's why we knew that there was still plenty of upside in prices growth in Melbourne and Sydney, because not only would, would they reach that previous peak point, but that peak point was three years ago. And they also had increased uh, incomes to take advantage of over that three year period. And they also had lower interest rates to take advantage of. That's why we clearly had the potential to grow 10% in Melbourne and Sydney this year, pre-coronavirus, yeah. just based on the fact that they had fallen so far in 2018 and 19. This isn't rocket science, Rich. Yeah. And yet those that comment on the market just couldn't pick it up. They yeah. just looked at the numbers in isolation and said, oh, gee, that's a very strong rate. You know, we, we can't keep growing at that rate. Well, we could keep growing at that rate because it was about the fact that we were still below where we were before. And this chart tells us that even with that strong growth, that Melbourne and Sydney had still not reached its previous peak point. However, Brisbane and Adelaide had, uh, and Perth was still in the correction environment. Now, going forward, if things had have remained as they were, we certainly would have seen Melbourne and Sydney moving into that expansion phase above the point, previous peak points of 2007, uh, 2017, 
Um, and that was because we had that capacity to grow faster, even without interest rate cuts uh, in the real time, but we still had interest rate cuts last year and incomes growth over the past, although it was slow, it was still growth over the past uh, two to three years. That would have pushed prices up potentially, all yeah. things being equal, uh, by around 10%. So it wasn't some crazy boom, it was just a natural re Just moving back to where our previous market. peak. Yeah, it was just a rebalancing back to previous levels, Rich, where yeah. Brisbane and Adelaide have been notionally over that whole period. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you. Um, awesome. Just Don, let's make a point for anyone watching. If you do want to, we will have a time for Q and A uh, toward the end of our webinar. We, we only need to finish it about uh, quarter to uh, quarter to two, so we've got about thirty minutes left. And if you do want to ask a question, just jump into the Q and A. Uh, sorry, to the chat box um, on the screen there, and, and we'll endeavour to get to your question as quick as we can. Um, so, Andrew, we might just move on. That's current uh, median uh, price yeah, across the... each of the cities there. That's pretty self-explanatory. We've got a bit more that I want to get through, so we might just jump through that. Obviously, Sydney, the most expensive, leading the way, followed by Melbourne, then Brisbane. Um, we won't dwell on, on where those prices are perfectly at the moment, but let's have a look at bank lending. Um, obviously, APRA fiddled uh, with the, the lending controls and the, uh, the capital ratios that banks were supposed to hold. and um, Let's have a look at where where we see finance approvals going. So tell us uh, briefly, Andrew, what's what's happening with finance approvals? Oops, sorry, I've gone too far. Well, well what that slide shows us is ABS um, home loan approvals, Rich. Mm. The gold line at the top are owner occupiers, and we can see that it was owner occupiers that regenerated our housing markets through 2019, quite a sharp revival. Again, it tracks what happened to house prices really a catch-up environment um, with levels returning back to where they were at previous peaks. We can see that big gap between the black and the gold, and that's investors, the black line. Um, investors started to pick up. They certainly didn't pick up as strongly as, um, uh, as uh, the owner-occupiers did, but there were signs that investors were moving back into the market. I think that there were still constraints to lending to investors from the banks last year. Uh, that was a hangover from both the APRA policies uh, and I think that was more a cultural thing. And of course, the, uh, the Royal Commission, the Banking Royal Commission, which I think was a bit of a, uh, a non-event, certainly in terms of the recommendations being implemented. I mean, nobody ever talks about that anyway, anymore. But I do think that, um, I do think that the, um, uh, uh, you know, the culture of investment towards investors from banks, uh, lending to investors uh, was, was, was one that was about over risk management. Um, but uh, we, we started to see that improve. Now, the bottom, uh, the bottom chart, the grey bar charts, uh, that's first home buyers. And we saw first home buyers moving back into the market quite uh, strongly last year, the second half of last year. Uh, and that was a fact of prices were rising. Uh, there's nothing worse for first home buyers than to be seeing prices on the increase because unlike owner occupiers, Rich, they don't have a trade in to bring into the market. So they, if they see prices rising, they have to go and earn more money to get a bigger deposit to yeah. get into the market. So they typically, when they see prices rising, they get into the market as quickly as they can, exactly. which yeah. we saw. But the other point, of course, is that from January, we had a new policy introduced by the government, first home owner uh, deposit grant, which meant that, uh, or deposit scheme, which meant that first home buyers could buy eligible first home buyers could yeah. purchase a property with just five percent deposit, and the government would pay the or yeah. cover the first time, the mortgage insurance. Yeah. So we saw first home buyers certainly up and running as well. Um, but most parts of the market and investors coming a little bit late uh, certainly picked up as uh, as the market picked up over the second half of last year. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, and we're seeing the uh, the total volume of lending still actually down. Still so down, yeah, yeah and that reflects down. a little bit that we've seen yeah. prices are still below that's roughly right. yeah. Melbourne and Sydney where they were at their previous peaks, but that's just right. down marginally. Yeah. Well, let's move on briefly then to rental markets, and then uh, we're also going to then talk about dwelling supply. So we're seeing um, obviously a lot of pressure from people who've lost their jobs, you know, renegotiating their rents or yep. struggling to pay if they become suddenly unemployed or stood down. Um, but uh, what, what's your take on, on the rental market? Are we going to see rents uh, go sideways, go down, or, where, where, or is there still going to be pressure, Andrew? Where, what's your view? Well, of course, Rich, this is a, a, a fluid environment. Um, we're not sure of the, I guess, the consequences 
of loss of work on rental markets, you know, in, intuitively, uh, we know that that will create less demand for rental properties. But we've got to also realise that the government are being very proactive in terms of supporting those tenants who are under financial stress. So it may not have as strong an impact as we would, uh, I guess, expect from those that are losing their jobs uh, and on demand for rental properties. But this will reveal itself as a lot of things will over the next month. Mm. Um, but certainly most of our rental markets are tight. The exception has been the Sydney market, um, which has seen a, a down uh, turn in rents over the past year or so. Mm. But my data is showing that uh, over the last month that rents in Sydney have actually increased for houses. Mm -hmm. um, up to 510 from 500 per week. So maybe there's a turn there, but we are in a different environment now, Rich. We need to wait to see how the data pans out mm -hmm. over the next month. But we've got to understand that at least from the point of view of those tenants that are under stress through these coronavirus sanctions, mm -hmm. uh, are being given government support, um, which may help to ease any reduction, significant reduction in demand for rental properties. But again, this is all part of the consequences for mm. the coronavirus um, yeah. uh, uh, policies. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So there's um, a bit of your data there. Look, we'll be able to share these slides too with yes. all our participants later. So if we're going a bit quick, don't, don't stress, we'll be able to share this with you. Um, we're also seeing vacancy rates uh, at, a, at obviously different levels. So, you know, for, for houses, um, Sydney vacancy rates got up to around three or 3.2% 3 at one point, now down to about 2.6%. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how vacancy rates go. But obviously, with the uh, evictions uh, on, put on hold for the time yeah. being, um, I think people will be happy just to, uh, to stay put for where they are at the moment um, and, uh, and try to maintain the status quo. Um, also, the other point we made this before, Andrew, is it's just really important for, for investors to consider yeah. yield. And yeah. what can you do with your money? I mean, if you're going to put it yeah. into a term deposit or yeah. a, a government bond, you, you're going to be getting 1% or lower. Um, so just explain your, your thoughts on, on this slide, Andrew. Well, I think that's been one of the big changes in our low interest rate environment, Rich, is we've seen really a stable, these are gross yields for all the capital cities for units. Um, we've seen a real a stable process, which normally we do for yields, mm. um, because prices and rents usually track according to interest rates. Um, but we've seen, as I said, that stable environment for yields. But of course, we've seen a, a real flattening in the returns you get for uh, as a borrower, as a uh, as a borrower, sorry, as a uh, as a lender, a depositor uh, for banks in the bank, and that's down at 0.9 percent. Now this is March quarter stuff, and that's going to go even lower, Rich. Uh, mm. And this is for a de term deposit of ten thousand mm. dollars for a year or more, and that's down at uh, over March, the latest data at just 0.9 of a percent, mm. and likely to fall, even though banks will, uh, the government will. Um, ask banks to subsidise that. Now you can see the big difference now between gross yields in units versus um, versus what you get from a similar asset class, which is um, a bank deposit. Uh, and that difference is really, I think, an important element in looking towards the advantages that investment in rental properties have from the point of view of income. Um, of course, investors still have significant taxation advantages uh, as, um, uh, as, as residential investors. Um, so they get to claim, depending on their circumstances, uh, against their uh, against their tax position. Mm. But you can see that white space is now at its, uh, at its widest level um, between bank deposits and return on investments. Mm. And this gets back to what we were saying before, Rich, about the, I guess, you know, the notion that, you know, price is doubling every X years. Well, you know, so what? Um, so it was inflation, and that meant that your wage, the, the ability to spend was reducing by 50%, you know. So with low interest rates now as, as a long-term outcome, mm. we know that income levels are going to be much lower. So mm. even though we're looking at returns of 4 to 5% from gross yields, um, that actually is an advantage over other asset class returns. Yeah. And when we add that to capital growth, mm. we actually see a, 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 an elevated uh, return capital growth plus uh, gross yields mm. compared to any other capital class yeah, yeah. class in, in what is still um, you know a blue chip investment environment through yeah. the uh, the longer period. Yeah. Sorry, I just move along, Andrew, to uh, this slide. I thought this is a cracking one just to uh, explain uh, 
where we've seen property prices grow compared to uh, the equity market. So give us a quick snapshot of this one. Well, it's probably not fair in a way, Rich, because this is pre-coronavirus. Of course, we had a crash in the property market in the uh, yeah. in the stock market uh, when the coronavirus issue hit. Um, so this is the uh, all odds growth, the Australian share market growth prior to that crash mm -hmm. um, from its previous peak uh, prior to the GFC, and that was in November 2007. And we can see that Australian, well, Sydney and Melbourne house prices actually doubled in that period, whereas Australian shares up by just 5%. In fact, US shares doubled as well. Mm -hmm. Now, um, look, shares are a different asset, asset class, Rich. There's no doubt that uh, residential investment is for the medium to longer term. That's the road to wealth and security and prosperity. Um, shares are a different class in terms of them being more volatile, obviously. They're more uh, of a liquid asset. We saw that with that very strong decline in prices, in share prices, uh, down by 40% uh, odd when we did have that um, crash in the market uh, when the coronavirus issue hit. Now, um, so I guess it's not fair to compare it in that sense because yeah. the shares tend to reflect short-term um, energy in terms of consumer sentiment, which we can't really get from the housing market. Uh, as we've discussed, we're waiting to get more insights into what's happening in the housing market, which takes some time or can take certainly yeah. weeks and maybe a month or so, whereas the share market can tell us you know, from day to day what's happening. Now, on a positive note, despite that crash, Rich, I'd like to point out that over the last week, we've actually seen the Australian share market start to form a base and move upwards again. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the panic and the fear factor has moderated now um, that we're starting to see some I guess, more clear thinking in investment decisions on the share market. Uh, it is rising, it's still well below where it was at its uh, pre-coronavirus peak. But I do think that shows the way forward in terms of confidence. And I think that's a good thing uh, for all our markets and our economy, that there's now some more rational yep. uh, you know, investment going on in our share market. That's right. Okay. So, um, so as, you, as you mentioned, look, you just the key economic principle, rise of demand, falling supply, we're going to see higher prices and rents. Like we're not discounting the fact of the COVID-19 impact on one iota. Absolutely. But, but we've got to remember what base we've come off uh, before we start to see the recovery. And the recovery doesn't happen necessarily overnight. I think there'll be a bit of a drag on the economy with unemployment. Um, even if unemployment hits 10%, which is a pretty dramatic turnaround, still 90% of people are employed. And That's so right. once we get back to work and start the wheels of the economy moving, I think we're gonna to start to see the property market start to track up again fairly strongly. Um, Andrew, I just wanna move in briefly now just to a question a lot of people's lips and is, is I get asked every day, look, how should we respond to the market? You know, buying or investing against the tide, is, is this the window of opportunity? Because I don't wanna catch a falling knife is often a phrase on, on talk to, that people say to me. So is this really a time or a window of opportunity? Um, and I just want to briefly uh, mention, just obviously with our services as buyers agents, uh, for any of our viewers today that are watching this, we are willing to provide a 10% discount off our engagement fees. Um, you've got to mention the, the code word, COVID-2020. Hopefully there isn't a COVID-2020, but uh, mention that code word to us. And please just send us a, a note or an email to Peter Domjan, our Director of Client Strategy, just to discuss your property plans. If you've got a whole bunch more questions and you're actually going, you know what, I do believe the next three months will provide some really good buying opportunities and I'd like to capitalise on that. Um, and particularly in the off-market space, then we'd certainly love to, to help you achieve those goals and work with you and make sure you're not overpaying on a property and you're paying fair market value or even better because we're getting some good discounts. Um, and these are the seven steps. I won't go into detail now, but these are the seven steps that we take all of our buyers through. We help you create a strategy, provide you with in-depth research, we find a lot of properties off market. I think, Andrew, in this current market, um, this is where buyers agents are really going to shine in their relationship with agents because it's more difficult to get access to properties. A lot of people don't want to actually advertise the fact they're selling. We do you know, a lot of our, our transactions, probably even up to 50% of our transactions, transactions off market. Um, and we provide a very accurate appraisal to our clients, help them secure the property, negotiate it and provide a, a property manager. So that's sort of an end-to-end -end service that, that we provide for our, our clients. So if you'd like to do that, please get in touch with us and uh, we'd be delighted to help you. 
And Andrew, for our last part of um, today, I just want to briefly ask you about supply and demand. You know, we often hear things banded about in the media about, you know, are we oversupplied? Are we undersupplied? Do we have a balanced market? Let's try and dispel some of those myths here uh, before we go to our Q&A session. So the question is, will Australia be undersupplied or oversupplied with housing? And we've got some figures here that you can talk to about this. Well, it's no doubt that we were moving or are moving pre-coronavirus issue into an undersupplied market generally. Mm. A few exceptions. I have a model that I use, Rich, that tracks uh, an undersupply and oversupply environment in our capital city markets. We saw a collapse in home building over the last two years. A lot of that, of course, was because of falling house prices and falling demand, which was a product of those mm. APRA policies. Um, we've seen a real sharp decline in, uh, in unit development particularly. And of course, if, as we continue to see new demand, which we can look at as being migration and first home buyer activity uh, continue, we're not matching that with new supply. And that'll only mean upward pressure on rents and prices. And there's no doubt that we're moving into an undersupplied environment um, because of a lot of the negative policy settings uh, that were based on uh, wrong predictions of overheating housing markets uh, and overbuilding. Uh, in fact, we're now we've mismatched demand with supply to the point uh, where we are, as I said, moving into undersupply in most of our markets. Mm, interesting. Okay. Um, so, are we going to? Yeah, if we go into oversupply, does that mean rents up or down? Um, this yeah. is one of your your index uh, charts here. So, perhaps just yeah. take us through briefly what what this means. Well, what this does, Rich, is it combines supply and demand and comes up with a net supply, uh, a net supply figure. So what I do is I account for first home buyers and net migration as a demand factor for each of our capital city markets. So what I do is I look at that as being net new demand. So that's a combination of first home buyers and, my, and, and net migration. Of course, they don't bring either a house or a trade in into the marketplace. I discount owner occupiers as being changeover buyers. So they virtually trade houses amongst themselves. It doesn't matter for the purpose of the model because I use the same, uh, I use the same factors for each of the capital city markets. So they're all consistent. Uh, and then I match that with actual new uh, housing completions. So I take the ABS approvals data, I convert that into a completion, which is pretty straightforward. And then I take one from the other, so I take new supply from new demand to find out what our net supply balance is uh, per capital city market. And then I divide that by the number of households in each of the capital city markets. So that gives us then a, a relative measure that's mm. compatible with each of the markets. Uh, and then I convert that percentage to an index of 100 plus or 100 minus. And that then uh, allows us to compare each of the capital city markets on that undersupplied, oversupplied uh, measure. And we can see there that the Melbourne and Brisbane markets are the ones that are now clearly undersupplied. That means that there's uh, more demand than supply uh, in real time. And um, uh, we can see that all other markets with the exception of Darwin and Canberra are in the mid point, neither above uh, the red line or below the green line. But the trend clearly for all those markets is heading towards the green line with the exception of Darwin and Canberra. Canberra's had a, a very strong period of apartment development, uh, which has pushed them into that notional oversupply. And Darwin has also had a very strong period of apartment development, but it's also had a significant period of reduction in migration, which mm. has been that sort of the twin forces of reduced uh, demand and reduced supply, but certainly Melbourne and Sydney, uh, Melbourne and um, Brisbane, are, according to my index, are in now in undersupply mode, uh, and uh, Sydney is now moving into that uh, mode as well, with the trend uh, clearly uh, downwards. Very good. So, just to sort of wrap up the overview before we move on to Q and A, um, obviously we've seen the the coronavirus shock has has put a dramatic uh, impact, had a dramatic impact on on the housing market. Yep. Um, but we've seen that the, we're not saying that the underlying factors have completely changed. It's, at the moment, it's the way in which we transact property has been dramatically affected. Yes. And we're going to see the government uh, throw as much money, you know, over $200 billion worth to, to get us through, uh, to try to get us out the other side. And it looks like that 
it looks likely that we'll have a, a recession, uh, a negative uh, couple of quarters of growth, but then it's potentially a, a pretty strong revival uh, in that spring season. Um, and another question we get asked all the time is, is, is the stimulus package enough? You know, have the government thrown everything they possibly can? So, Andrew, I won't get into a big discussion. I just want to move to the Q&A session now, but there's a whole bunch of different fiscal strategies that the, uh, that the government could use uh, to really boost particularly the property sector in giving more um, alleviation of the pain. I mean, we've seen the New South Wales government give some relief to stamp duty if they reduce rents and that sort of thing, but there's a whole bunch of, of different things. But we basically want to see the government keep people in their jobs and keep business afloat as best they can during this very difficult time. Um, we might just move now to Q, Q questions and answers. And um, I guess just one to kick it off, Andrew, I'll kick it off, but how long will this, uh, this property uh, downturn last? What's your thoughts on that in terms of timing? Well, it depends essentially, of course, Rich, on how long the shutdown lasts. Mm. Um, the sooner we get back to work, get back to normal you know, living environment, mm. the sooner we'll get into recovery mode, uh, the sooner the government can act directly to stimulate the economy. Uh, mm. And that will be, I guess, the starting point for uh, our revival. Um, I think that we can learn a lesson from last year. Uh, we uh, momentum built quite quickly. A year ago, nearly or just over a year ago, we were in a downturn in the property. We seem to forget that. Um, human nature forgets the bad news quickly. But um, we certainly turned around and we were turning around earlier than many uh, gave uh, or many uh, said because, you know, the the, uh, I guess the reasons were, were put forward why our markets regenerated was the re-election of the Morrison government and the impact that had on investors. Well, that actually was a nonsense because we didn't see a revival in investors after the re-election of the Morrison government. There was no doubt that the cuts to interest rates were a positive for our housing market, but our housing markets were already showing green shoots by then. Uh, and, those, and that was about you know, the buyer sentiment changing or turning because buyers were perceiving it was a good time to buy. Mm. Now, essentially it was a buyer's market a year ago, Rich. We are now moving into a buyer's market. Transactions are still happening. This will be a buyer's market until such time as sellers start to realise that prices have um, uh, got to the point where it's a good time to sell as well. Now we understand that most buyers are sellers and sellers are buyers. Um, so that, that time it takes from a buyer's market to turn into a seller's market is usually not that long and uh, we don't have the leverage of lower interest rates to help us this time um, but I still think the potential for momentum uh, is to build the market as we did last year. Hmm. Okay. The uh, shutdown sooner rather than later um, and I'm talking about the next month or so uh, that we've got the prospect of having Andrew, your, your, your audio is just cutting in and out a little bit there for a second. So just double check your audio is okay. okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. sorry about that. Um, Andrew, you might just move to quick, a couple of quick questions on the yes. chat. Um, Greg has said it's widely accepted that unemployment will hit 8 to 10%, if not higher, uh, yep. for at least two to three years. How can this be anything other than a negative for the property market over the coming years? Well, I think that that's a rational expectation, but whether it stays at that level for that long, I think, you know, that'd be a, a hard question to ask a government, why haven't you reduced unemployment? Mm. Um, I don't think it will remain at those levels for that period of time, given what should be a very strong government reaction or mm. response in terms of policies mm. to that level of unemployment. But let's understand that high levels of unemployment have not traditionally been a negative impact on the housing market. I mean, when we had our uh, highest level of unemployment since the Great Depression, which was in the recession of 91 to 92, um, unemployment rates reached over 10% nationally. And in, um, you know, in Melbourne, they were, in Victoria, unemployment rates reached 14%. Now, even though prices eased during that period, uh, there wasn't a sharp decline in house prices. Yeah. I mean, higher interest rates are usually what uh, are the factor that usually push down sharply house prices. Now we don't have that interest rate uh, energy in our uh, economy anymore. Yep. Um, and you've got to remember, as you said, Richie, if we have 10% unemployed, we still have 90% of people in work. 
And most of the people in work will be those that are at uh, more advanced periods in terms of their career status, their financial positions, and they will still be in the, in the, the business of wanting a bigger home or a smaller home yeah. or moving to the beach or moving to the bush once yeah. confidence has been restored. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the simple answer is that we're only looking at a small percentage of those that are impacted in terms of confidence in the property market. That's and it. Confidence and it's certainly will be not, the key and, going forward. And I guess, obviously, we have great empathy for those that have been affected by Absolutely. unemployment. I think it's certainly hard for them. We've got one other question here. Um, is it not best to not buy now and wait for 12 months to see a correction of up to 20%, then consider buying? What do you think? Well, I'll handle that one. Um, I think that we get asked, is now the best time to buy? Should I just wait till I hit the bottom of the market? Well, I've always found it's virtually impossible to actually pick the, pre the precise time to buy at the bottom of the market. In 2019, the best time to buy was on federal election day from a purple bridge states, which they had no idea what they're doing. Um, but no one was really around on election day buying properties. Um, I tend to say to my clients, buy when you're finance approved and pay a fair market value that's reflective of the long-term value of the property. I can tell you that I've bought three properties for my clients in the last three weeks, and I've got discounts of somewhere between 5% to around 12% already. So we're actually already getting discounts for our clients in this current market. And if you hold, like even if property prices went down another 5% and you've already got 12% you know, off, you're going to ride out the cycle on the other end. What you don't want to do is be waiting for four months in the spring season and suddenly you've got 10 other buyers all trying to buy the same property that you want to buy and you probably need to spend a little bit more to get it. Um, that would be my view. Um, another question here. We are preparing our Melbourne investment property for sale just as coronavirus hit. Should we continue with sale or wait till property prices go up? Well, I guess that's a personal question from Lena. And I would say, Lena, that's a tough one to answer, but if you need to sell now and it, it makes sense to sell and you can get uh, and achieve a reasonable price, you're not gonna break any records in this market. Um, yeah, perhaps continue with the sale. If not, if you can hold it for the longer term and get a tenant to, to see you through, then perhaps hold it for a, a longer period of time. Um, another question from Frank. From our experience from our recent correction pre-election, prices will bounce back fast and you can't pick the bottom. Uh, as when you visually see the bottom of the charts, you've already missed 12%. Therefore, I believe waiting 12 months to buy will be too long. I guess that's a statement. Um, some other question here. I was about to list my home in Melbourne near Melbourne Airport just before the virus and purchase at Ocean Grove. What are your thoughts? Should I go ahead now? Well, look, if you're buying and selling in the same market, um, you probably take a small hit on the, the price that you wanted to achieve, but you'll make it up on the buy side. So what I would say to you is don't let the virus determine your, your overall goals. You can still buy and trade property in this market. Um, just get the right advice and the right agents and the right people around you and make sure they've got your interests at heart. Um, what's some other questions here we've got? So, what would be the best scenario? A couple of properties in a growth corridor or one blue chip, not blue chip, one blue chip property? Um, look, I guess that question, Marcio, that's more a, a question for us to take offline. I'd recommend you have a chat with Pete Dominton, our strategist, to work out what might work for your individual situation. Um, do you feel the share market has bottomed, Andrew? What do you think on that one? Yeah, I do, Rich. I mean, I'm not a financial advisor and I just track trends, but um, the whole point to how sharply our share market fell was about sentiment, of course, and, and unknown and the fear. But I, I do think, and I said that prior, that if you look at the chart, you can see now clearly a bottom has formed. Um, and I think that that's a good thing for confidence because I think the panic's gone out of the market. Now, if and when and how long it takes to get back to where we were pre-coronavirus in terms of the share market uh, is the question now. Mm. And that will be, I guess, more about fundamentals rather than panic and fear. Uh, and that'll be about when the data starts to come out mm. about how the economic or how the economy has responded. Yep, okay. Uh, what's happened over the past month. So I'd say, yes, it has, uh, it, it has yeah. bottomed out. Okay. Uh, but the journey back will be quite uh, will quite yeah. lengthy, depend on... Another, another good question from someone in the Q&A section that said, with the increase in work from home, will this change the places people move and live, i.e. away from cities? I was actually asked this question just before the, um, the, the seminar today. My view is that, look, we're all working from home to some degree. 
Um, and we're seeing that it's changing the way we work. I, I don't think it's actually going to change property values uh, that much directly. We've always had telecommuting. We've always had the ability to work from home. But I think collaboration face-to-face -face always trumps a Zoom call, in my view. Um, I think it'll just change, the, you know, it'll make working with home perhaps a bit more commonplace uh, and won't be as frowned upon as long as people are productive. Um, another question, uh, how does a recession affect housing prices, Andrew? How does a recession affect housing prices? Well, it depends what's caused the recession, Rich. I mean, if it's higher interest rates, which is what caused the recession in uh, 91, 92, obviously that is, as we spoke at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, is a negative for house prices because it makes uh, how it impacts housing affordability because you know your interest rate is higher. Um, if it impacts uh, unemployment, which typically we see higher unemployment mm -hmm. because businesses have to pay more for their finance in a higher interest rate environment, yes. um, but not at that same level as we saw in 2000 uh, in uh, 1991, 92. Mm -hmm. But certainly it affects um, uh, confidence, investment investment not just from businesses but also uh, from individuals but again this recession is not a business cycle driven recession if you understand what I mean mm. this is something that's we've just never really experienced before it's mm. a deliberate stopping of our economy yeah not based on it's not based on any um, imbalance in our economy we've just decided to stop the economy you know for a, for a health issue that's right. So, you know, we're in uncharted waters in terms of that. But it does mean that if we've stopped it, then perhaps we can start it again. That's and right. the aim is to get back to where we were. Well, we hope we're not going to stop the hibernation. We're not well, going to stop the hibernation for too long, eh? So, yeah, yeah, well, if it's, uh, if, it's, if it's fundamental to an imbalance in the economy, that's a lot harder to do. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, Andrew, um, we're just about out of time. Um, but yes. just to wrap up, um, obviously, you know, you always say, and I agree with you, that um, despite the, the dramatic economic shock that COVID-19 has had, our markets are robust, reliable and resilient. And we will get through, notwithstanding the, the tremendous shock and upheaval that this is causing. Um, I just want to say thank you, Andrew, particularly for... Thank you very much, Rich. Yes. Good luck, really, everybody, too. Really, Good luck. Really appreciate your, your advice. and. For anyone out there that would like to ask further questions and engage with us, uh, my details are there on the screen. Andrew, um, obviously, um, is, is online, particularly on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is a good one, yeah. On LinkedIn, and you can get Andrew's uh, live data, particularly on auctions and his commentary there, so highly recommend that. And please just give us a ring on 1300 655 615 or go to our website. We'd love to engage with you further and certainly wish you all the well and staying safe in this difficult time. And uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. So thanks so much for joining us, guys. And uh, we thank, thank you. you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.